All right, so today's topic is refractory cement or fire clay. There's a handout on what I educate the customers with. Talks about the need for refractory cement and what its purpose is, how it performs in a fireplace. Um, it's designed to act as a chimney lining component. So a chimney lining component is a high heat rated material that is designed to funnel and contain heat through the fireplace structure. The structure being the exterior wall or the interior hearth or in the structural wall of the fireplace facing. The breast right here, all these structural walls, we don't want them to be exposed to any heat. So the chimney lining in the firebox is refractory fire clay. There's uh, refractory cement, fire clay mortar, and refractory cement barge coated to the interior of the smoke chamber. So on your handout there, at the bottom, it says, the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association 211, standard for fireplace chimneys, vents, and solid fuel burning appliances. Code reference 11.2.1.13. Inner surfaces of the smoke chamber shall be parge coated smooth with an insulating refractory mortar. This material in the Oregon Code referenced here. Smoke chamber walls shall be constructed of solid masonry units. All of masonry units grouted solid. <laughs> to a minimum thickness, front to back, of eight inches. Inside surfaces shall be parged smooth with refractory mortar in accordance to ASTM C199. That American testing standard references the heat tolerances for a fire clay. It basically says this is how much heat it can withstand and it's 2,500 degrees. And you can achieve that in a number of ways, depending on your material or the, the building that you're working on, you can mix it in a number of ways. This is traditional high strength type S mortar. Um, you can use that and add a little bit of fire clay to it. Um, it gives you not as a high performance as far as heat rating, the grit inside of this material is much denser than the other material. Where did the other material go? All, all the, the, you know. <laughs> well, so, so this is... We want all these bags out here. So this is the fast and easy way to do it with Type S and Lincoln Fire Clay. But you can make your own mortar by sand, three parts sand. And the difference between the sand in this bag and the, this sand is how fine. This is like very fine beach sand. In this, you'll find really big grits. And those grits aren't the best because those little grit pieces will allow air pockets around and the, the mortar joint won't sit real tight and nice and neat and clean. We want our mortar joints to be a quarter of an inch thickness. Some historic houses, they're even tighter. They're like eighth inch, just teeny tiny. And it's mixing it by hand with this nice, really fine stuff that allows that. So if you're mixing it in the historic way, it's three scoops of sand, one scoop of cement, one scoop of lime, one scoop of fire clay. And this is the, the material that you get. And when you're using this on your trowel, you'll notice that it just sticks a lot more than if you mixed it with this. This mortar is structural mortar. It's really intended to be used on the exterior walls of the chimney. 
not the interior firebox lining or smoke chamber of the chimney. This material you can use for your fire clay joints. This material you can also throw up into the smoke chamber when you're parging those internal surfaces really smooth and clean. But if you just look at like the workability of this, it is just butter, smooth, and they'll set faster. The bricks will literally set faster. Put a little heater in the firebox and you can do a firebox way faster with, with this than you can with this. If you try and build a firebox with this, as soon as you get to the slant, the bricks are gonna fall off. They're just gonna fall on your face. So the other trick, which Jake has done here, is hydrating your fire brick before you lay. If you just, dry, if you just lay a, a dry brick, it's gonna suck all the moisture out of here and you're not gonna get a good bond between the units. So here Jake's laid like a, a firebox back wall. And we want our firebox back wall to be independent from the side walls. So the side walls will go past or in front. Best is actually the back wall first and the side wall front because you want the back wall to be able to expand and contract independent from the side wall. If you put the side wall here and this goes this way, it's going to force that out. If you put your side wall there, this can expand this way from heat, expansion, contraction, and it's not going to break down this whole side wall. When I see fireboxes laid like this, what you find is this joint right here between the facing and the fire bricks cracks. And if you get cracks between the fire brick and the facing, that's where you see this right here. Burnt framing on the header over the fireplace. Because that crack, it starts here and it goes up and it peels away right at that lintel, the steel lintel that supports the facing structure of the fireplace. So fireboxes are no joke, especially if you have a homeowner who is an avid wood burner. I mean, they just love to, to put wood in their fireplace. Each user is gonna have different experiences because of what fuel source they decide to burn. Some people just, you know, collect wood from their, their own property or get it from neighbors or whatever. And what I come across is that homeowners are really not conscious of the energy densities between wood species. Um, what I mean by energy density is if you download a, a chart online, if you just Google firewood BTU chart. BTU stands for British Thermal Unit. It's defined as the amount of energy needed to raise one liter of water one degree Fahrenheit. So BTU, you have a cord of firewood. A cord is four feet by four feet by eight feet. Pick it up, right? So if you look on a BTU chart of firewood, you look at fir, 17 million BTUs of energy in that wood species. And they have every single species of wood. And it shows you the BTU energy density of every single species. Now, oak, one cord, 30 million BTUs per cord. So that is like night and day energy density. Most homeowners will use a light wood, a soft wood like fir or cedar as their starting wood or, or real wood burners that they understand because your less energy dense wood is easier to work with. You can chop it really easily, it splinters, it turns into kindling. It's really nice to work with. You don't have to fight it to, to chop kindling. You wanna have real nice kindling the size of you know your thumb to start your fire. And I always instruct people to build their fire with that kindling in kind of like a teepee fashion versus, you know, log cabin style. And the reason for that is 
the or your rub watch. If you build a fire teepee style like this, you're able to ignite the wood on 360 degrees of the surface area going up, which creates a very strong hot draft and it'll break through that cold air pocket, but a lot of times chimneys will have cold air coming down the flue when you go to start the fire. You'll open the damper and you'll just fear this big rush of cold air. So I'll teach the homeowners, build a teepee style, get a little newspaper, put the newspaper up inside the, the throat of the smoke chamber, and you can see that flame start to suck the smoke up. And then bring that newspaper underneath your little teepee fire, and it will burn 360 degrees surface area of that fuel create just this beautiful, hot, good drafting fire. When you build it log cabin style, like this, the surface area of the wood that is burning is just right here. Or where it's, you know, so that what happens there is it's not quite enough heat to push through some of that negative pressure and air that's coming down the chimney and it just has to do with complete combustion of your fuel source. So once you get that light, light wood burnt down, you know, maybe 10 minutes, the light wood burns down into coals very, very quickly. You wanna have a nice coal bed, you know, the underneath your grate, because that's the foundation of your fire. It's what substantiates adding in a larger fuel load, a larger diameter of piece, or a more energy dense species of fuel. You gotta get it hot enough before you put in the energy dense stuff because there has to be enough heat to start combustion on the more energy dense fuel source. And it has so, to be seasoned properly. And it needs to be cured properly. The, the firewood uh, needs to be between 15 and 20% moisture content. If it has more moisture than that, they're gonna plug up their chimney with creosote very, very quickly. So uh, I really want you guys to, to know this stuff so that when homeowners are asking you questions when you're on the job site and stuff like that you're a wealth of knowledge you're a resource to them um, and you should say hey look at a firewood btu chart look at the different energy densities between the different species of wood so that they can be more conscious and take care of their investment because the work that we do on these things is very very expensive you know you have a question Stephen? Oh, i was going to say once you get your fire going you really want to make sure everything is going in the same, all your pieces are in the same direction. And the way I build a fire is actually a little different. I kind of do the log cabin, but it's more, you don't want to put cross members in because those don't allow the material to fall back into itself. And so I build the two big ones and then kindling on top and then big the pyramid ones Pyramid style. Yeah, yeah, pyramid style. And, and so then basically you're planning for everything to fall back in on itself. Because once you have pieces going the other direction, they burn out and then they're not touching the coals and they're elevated totally. and then they don't burn and smoke out. Totally. Everything has to be falling. The, the pyramid itself. style works too and, it, and it's really cool. So you've got your larger pieces at the bottom and you're kind of building this, it's still kind of a teepee, but it's log cabin <laughs> assembled. And so when you light the top of it, you got your tinder right there and it falls in on itself down through the center. And when you build it that way, you never have to stoke it, you never have to poke it. The fire literally burns its entire, everything oh, out. So, good good, uh, good tip there. Now, how long does that have to cure before I can put a fire in it? 28 days. 28 days is the cure time. Uh, because all of this moisture in this material, like we've saturated these bricks, you've got, you know, uh, water in the mortar mix. It takes 28 days for it to fully set, fully cure, uh, before we want them to build a fire. And when they go to build their first couple fires, I tell them we got to break it in. You don't want to have a big hot rager, you know, because if you have a big hot rager, it could crack. You want to kind of break it in slowly, have a couple short fires with some kindling maybe, because you gotta you gotta understand that if we're doing this work and it's the winter time, the moisture inside here is gonna have a harder time expressing. So masonry is like a sponge. When there's mortar in it, it needs a, a warmer temperature to literally exhale. 
inhale the water that is used to build it. So when I, when I tell them to, to build a fire and break it in, it's like short duration, very short, quick kindling fires. And what we're wanting to do is just very lightly expand and contract, expand and contract, expand and contract, not huge expansion, you know, right when it's done, because if we expand it too much and there's still some moisture inside the material, it'll crack. I gotta redo it. So. In the movie, The Great Outdoors, when Dan Aykroyd was warming the flu, uh -huh. that was a real thing then? It's a real thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, you gotta heat the flu. John Candy's nay hole. So, <laughs> sometimes um, you have just negative pressure mm -hmm. coming down the coal, flu. Coal goes to hot. Um, and sometimes the, the customer's furnace can actually create that. So when you have a real energy efficient, airtight home, and you have a furnace on, it's moving the air inside that living space, right? And sometimes it's so strong and the house is so airtight the only thing that's loose is the damper. So even if the damper's shut, it'll bring air down the chimney because the air, the, the room doesn't have enough oxygen in it and it's trying to get more oxygen in to kind of equalize the pressure. So a lot of times I'll tell customers, turn off your furnace before you light your fire. in the room that the fireplace is in, well, if you don't have pressure return from the outside, yeah. Cancel. I've had a lot of complaints like, oh, I smell this pretty soon. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of times in those settings, you'll see the fireplace room, and then just down the hallway or off to the kitchen and the floor, you'll see this big air return for the furnace. And it is basically sucking all the air in that living space down into the furnace and then pushing it back through the vents. So you got to turn off the furnace whenever you light your fire because what you're experiencing is two combustion systems fighting for oxygen. So you got to turn one off before the other one can start up. But then once you get this thing going, you know, and you got a, a really hot draft established and lots of hot uh, firewood going, they can go and turn their furnace back on and heat the other areas of their house. It'll, it'll work that way. It's just at the start. And it's really funny because um, we'll finish a job throughout this time of year and people will call in and say, you guys fix my fireplace and blah, 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 and, and it smokes. And so I've gone to people's house and shown them what they need to do to build a fire properly hundreds of times, hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> and every time I do it and walk them through it, they're like, oh, it makes so much sense. <laughs> this is so easy. I'm like, you can't yeah. start a fire with this fresh It really is. Just <laughs> you thought about it, you wouldn't have. You have to understand the, the science of it. You have to understand the conditions at which a fireplace work and in which they don't work. And if you don't really understand that, it's going to be hard to use your fireplace. <laughs> so, uh, any questions about fire clay or refractory cement? Or yeah. How long does the customer have to wait to burn a fire out there? 28 days. 28 days. Building that angle in the back wall, is it better to build up a bit of fire clay in the back to get it to angle or to cut the brick at an angle? Uh, cut the brick at an angle. Um, but this little pocket right here behind is a void. And see this little slope right here? Yeah. This is called your smoke shelf. And the smoke shelf design, this slope actually improves the draft efficiency of a fireplace. If it's just a big cavity behind there, left jagged, it's not that great. Because when a fireplace is drafting, you have air coming up through the damper right here. And then there's actually air coming down the chimney also. Air comes down the chimney and there's an exchange and it hits this smoke chamber shelf. And if it's sloped properly, it will come up on the lip of the back wall of the firebox and take this emission with it. Okay. And so we kind of want it to slope down and then back up. Yep. So there's just kind of like a little pocket back there. The smoke shelf. Smoke shelf. In the smoke. See right here? Smoke, smoke shelf. shelf. In the smoke chamber. In the smoke chamber. Yep. You didn't, you didn't there's the parge brick. Any other questions? You didn't speak on uh, heat stop at all. Heat stop. So heat stop is a, a fire clay 
pre-mixed um, or you can get it. It's basically the same as fire clay, like Lincoln's fire clay. It's a high heat additive and you use it for your flue liner joints between the, between the tiles. I read that it was coated. So between the joints of your flue tiles, see right there, you use heat stop. You can get it pre-mixed, or you can you can use the same fire clay mix. It's the same thing, basically. It's refractory cement in between the flue tiles. It's those joints that we need to use this refractory cement or fire clay mixture to get the insulating property in the mortar to contain the heat through the structure of the fireplace. Any other questions?